Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Baroness Valsi is in the news because she has apparently defected. Uh, she has defected. Uh, there are, uh, if you like, um, concrete, there is concrete evidence of her support for leaving. But she wasn't a particularly passionate campaigner. She wasn't a particularly prominent campaigner to leave. Uh, Yorkshire Post has published stories and, and her Twitter account reveals that she had declared her commitment to the Brexit cause. But it's, it's a mark of how strange and, I would say, desperate this whole debate has now become that she's being held up as some sort of scalp secured by the Remain side. Um, because of her prominence, I suppose, she's a scalp of sorts, but it's hardly as if somebody who's been passionately committed to the cause has undergone some form of Damascene conversion and decided that they were wrong all along. Also, the hate and xenophobia she describes on the Leave side is, well, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that that would have come as a surprise to her. And here's, here's the problem. Here is the problem. I think she's right uh, when she talks about hate and xenophobia. That won't come as a surprise to you. But to suggest that that is emblematic or representative of everybody who is keen to leave the European Union is, is desperately offensive. I know she hasn't done that, but a lot of people have. A lot of people do seem to be completely missing the hundreds of thousands, the millions of people who don't want to be in the European Union anymore, but don't actually feel comfortable with the tone of some of the debate, feel desperately uncomfortable. The notion that they are, uh, by siding in a democratic vote on membership of an institution, the, the, the notion that they are somehow signing up to a cause represented by division and sub-Nazi propaganda and terrible racist rhetoric, yeah, all right, I'm going to say it. I think the people I feel sorriest for in this whole country at the moment are the people who want to leave the European Union and hate racism just as much as all the self-congratulatory self right-on characters on the Remain side hate racism as well. But I've got family members. I've got close, close friends. Closest of friends. Uh, closest of relatives. Uh, my late father is uh, no longer with us, but I, I, I got a fair idea of where he'd want to cast his vote. And these are people who deplore and abhor racism with every iota of their being, who find the notion of uh, othering and xenophobia terrifying and wrong, but they don't want to stay in the European Union. Where are they? Who spoke for them during this debate? I, I got friends now who are going through paroxysms, paroxysms of self-recrimination and, well, the words they used is guilt this weekend because of events last week, which we will not discuss today. It would not be right to do so, and it would not be right to, to pick over whether or not any uh, politician is behaving in the right way or the wrong way <sighs> with regard to, 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 to the death of a sitting MP. So we won't go there, but we will say this, and we'll say it with a real sense of frustration and anger. Who spoke for all the people who don't like xenophobia, who don't like racism, who don't like the rhetoric of Goebbels, but who also don't like being in the European Union? I feel so sorry for you. I really do. You must feel rotten. Rotten at the moment. Rotten, betrayed, dispossessed and unrepresented. Because even the politicians that you thought would probably put your position forward, have, as Saeed Avasi alleges today, left themselves open to accusations of precisely the sort of hate and xenophobia that you thought, that we thought, that I thought they would <sighs> provide an alternative to. So, what I was thinking, and I, I don't know if, if, well, you have to help me out, actually, otherwise it's going to be a very long hour. What would this debate have looked like if it hadn't taken the lid off this Pandora's box? of unpleasantness. I, I, I guess I have to offer you an opportunity to deny that it has, but, you know, whether you're talking about posters that, that, that bear more than a passing resemblance to things we saw in continental Europe in the 1930s, or whether we're talking about people who, who have taken to social media effectively to applaud events or, or, or to somehow seek to excuse events on Friday, I, I think we can all agree the lid has come off. What I'm interested in, what I'm truly interested in, 
is the question of, of how else the debate could have unfolded. Could we realistically have been sitting here now in a country where we were discussing our future in a way that didn't seem to hinge upon whether you believe economists or whether you believe people keen to convince you that, that, that foreign immigration is wrecking everything and that these people are to be suspected. These people are, I, I said it on Friday, uh, these people are somehow to be all portrayed as, all Muslims are terrorists, all refugees are rapists, all migrants wish us harm. It, it, that's how it's broken down. That is how it has broken down. And I have said to you, and, and if you're kind enough to listen to me properly rather than jumping to conclusions or hearing what you want to hear, you'll know I've said from the very outset of this campaign that what worried me most was that we might make a, end up making a decision based on the wrong premises. You might end up voting to remain because you're so spooked by some of the bigotry that you see on the other side. That's not a reason. That doesn't make the EU bad. It might make some of its opponents, some of its enemies, some of its critics bad. It doesn't make the institution bad. Right? And similarly, you might vote to leave because these three issues that David Cameron identified last night, which are at the very least open to questioning and are, in his words, outright lies, the prospect of some sort of EU, unavoidable EU army, the prospect of Turkey uh, enjoying accession to the European Union and the £350 million figure on the side of the buses. If you end up voting as a result of those, and they do turn out not to be true, and there's possibilities I suppose we'll never know for sure, then you've made possibly the, 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 possibly the right decision for the wrong reasons, or indeed the wrong decision for the wrong reasons. That, that's why I feel so let down. And my profession has a hell of a lot to answer for, probably more than even the politicals do. Uh, it, it's the media and the press. The conflation, the, 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 my goodness me, the collections of front pages that some people put together over the weekend in response to Friday's tragic events, looking for questions about where hatred comes from, who the hate preachers are, potentially in the context of the sort of feelings that Saeed Avasi has described this morning. It, it, it's journalists. Journal well, actually, it's, it's newspaper owners, mostly, who should really be looking hard in the mirror this morning and aren't. I can tell you now from the front page of the two most obvious suspects, absolutely nothing has changed with regard to coverage of these issues. Absolutely nothing. I'm just looking for the papers now. I'm not going to have them, am I? It is the law of Murphy, I think. Um, but, uh, you know, here's one. PM's TV mauling over migration, uh, jeered and compared to Neville Chamberlain for hailing his EU deal as a success. There is one battlefield on which outlets like that want to fight this referendum and the battlefield on which I'd like to have seen it fought was the one which the one which somehow addressed the big issues but avoided the lens of othering avoided the lens of of xenophobia 30 minutes after 10 so what am I asking you this morning well I'll tell you what I'm asking you I'm asking you what it could have been like this debate what it could have looked like okay Hit the numbers now, you will get through. 0345 6060 973. How, how, how else could it have gone? If we'd managed to avoid the, 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 the posters, or the particular poster that, that just really confirmed so many people's worst fears about what elements of that side of the argument wanted or stood for or were comfortable going along with. And I would remind you that, that Michael Gove and, and others have condemned that poster that Mr Farage unveiled last week as well. So it is by no means confined to Remain supporters. Disgust at that poster in many ways sums up the question that I'm asking you. How, how else could it have gone? How, how do you think, if you were in charge, and you could somehow pull the strings, if all this nonsense of new world orders and, 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 and secret governments, if it was all true, you were in charge, you could do whatever you wanted, how would this debate have gone? What do you think? Is there any way this could have unfolded? Is there any way this could have unfolded somehow free from the shadow of what Lady Varsi describes this morning as hate and xenophobia? <sighs> I, I, I don't know. I, I've said to you from the very start that I was worried that it wouldn't. But that doesn't mean that it couldn't. Hit the numbers now, you will get through. Do you think this referendum debate could have been conducted in a way that did not lead one side, leave one side open to these accusations from uh, a defector this morning, hate and xenophobia, and the other side 
very prone, and, and I, I, I know some people think I've been guilty of this. I'm supremely confident that I haven't. We're back in the hearing what you want to hear territory on this, but suggest, because it would involve me calling, as I've just mentioned, people I love, people I'm deeply fond of, I certainly don't consider them to be bigots or racists or xenophobes, but they're, they're, they're keen to leave the European Union for a whole host of reasons, many of which haven't really seen the light of day in the context of informed debate. Uh, uh, people on the on the Remain side very, very keen to cast everybody on the Leave side as some sort of uh, quasi-national front supporter. It's horrible. Horrible, horrible, horrible. But could it have gone any other way? Was this always, was this always going to be the referendum route? Could we have had a debate? Could we have had a referendum? Could we have contemplated life outside the European Union without the atmosphere of hate and xenophobia which Vasaida Vasi describes this morning as her reason for abandoning Brexit and defecting to the Remain campaign? It's pathetic just for the record, in my humble, absolutely pathetic. The idea, that the, the, the arguments that persuaded her to be in favour of leaving the European Union can somehow be undermined, challenged and dismantled by the discovery that there were people on the same side of the argument whose politics were a little pungent is absolutely pathetic. If she hadn't already got a seat in the Lords, I would genuinely suspect that they dangled one in front of her to get her to do this. But it doesn't mean she's wrong. I Means she's unreliable, unimpressive, unintelligent, possibly. But it doesn't mean she's wrong when she talks about hate and xenophobia. So, could you conceive of a debate, a referendum campaign, that had somehow managed to avoid it? Ten nineteen is the time. Prakash is in Camberwell. Prakash, what would you like to say? Hi. Good morning. Hello, mate. Um, I just wanted to say I resonate with an awful lot of what you've just been saying. I mean, basically, um, I'm in favour of coming out, and the two reasons being the issue of democracy and TTIP. And then I've got a daughter who's voting to stay in, but she couldn't bear to vote to stay out because she can't align herself with, the, with some of the racist things that have been... But e even if you're right about the other stuff, she feels it so keenly that... And that, that's, 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 that's not right. That's some sort of... Di that's... that's diluted democracy, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And I think that part of the problem is the way the debate has been framed. Um, I, I think there should have been a proper consultation with the public, not just a yes or no vote, but to tease out what the issues are. Like, we haven't really had a discussion about TTIP, we haven't really had a discussion about democracy, and I would have liked a consultation process that then resulted in four questions. The, number one, whether we come out, number two, whether we stay in, number three, hey, that's the same question. <laughs> and number four, whether we stay in subject to su the, the satisfactory conclusion of those negotiations. Well, you know what you've done, and I know it wasn't your intention. Arguably, you've made a case against having referenda at all, because the point about a representative democracy is that we elect people who we are supposed to trust to a degree to be yeah. sufficiently enlightened, educated, and informed to take these complicated and difficult decisions for us. The minute you call a referendum, it has to be binary. It can't, because that's the opposite of representative democracy. That's direct democracy, so to speak, which means you're asking people who haven't really got a clue what day it is to cast a vote uh, in a referendum with exactly the same weight and power as people on either side of this debate who spent their whole life studying every nuance and every wrinkle. It's, it's, well, it's never going to work. But, but the, the, the debate has been within, as you said, su within such a narrow framework and therefore therefore there hasn't been a proper exploration of the issue. But how well do you think your side would have done if it had been talking about democracy and, and sovereignty and TTIP all the time and never mentioning uh, Turks and, and refugees and race? Well, those issues are important, but in the right context. I mean, for example, with the Turkish issue, my concern is more to do with them shooting down Russian planes and having NATO bases and behaving inappropriately, you know, uh, and, and, and rather than... But, you know, with the greatest of respect, this again is kind of the point I was alluding to and you're now proving, is that the debate would not have been compelling enough. It would have been quite dull. It would have been very hard to yeah. persuade people on your side of the argument to, to, to feel strength, strongly and passionately and keenly that they're on the right side if you, if, if you hadn't put effort into, into frightening them. Yeah. Which is what your daughter believes. So what do you say to your daughter, Prakash, when she says to you, but Dad, how can you be on, regardless of the complicated questions about sovereignty and democracy and, and, and TTIP, how can you be on the same side as these people? I presume from your name that, that you're of 
Asian extraction. Asian, Asian on. Origin, yeah, yeah, so you go, you, you, you're like this texter here. This is, you're, you're like Pat, who says, spare a thought for some of us in ethnic minorities who want to vote leave and get spoken to as if we don't actually know that we're black. So again, that, that, the race comes into it from the other end of the telescope. That, that's right. What that's do you say right. to your daughter when she says, how can well, you side I, with these I, people? I say to her, look, you've got to almost ignore what some, the, the, the racist debate, because it isn't the nub of the issue. And if we get, if we end up voting for the wrong issue, we end up in a place that we don't want, because those issues are not going to go away anyway. And, and the issue of, of democracy and TTIP and how, and our own sovereignty and how we run our country is just fundamental to everything. But it wouldn't make a front page, would it? No. It wouldn't make a front page. <laughs> Public fury at TTIP confusion, or Cameron can't ask questions about theoretical democracy or competing theories of sovereignty I, it's just not going to wash is no, it uh, and that's the problem isn't it we don't it's the level at which this debate is being conducted it's it's almost appealing to the worst parts of all of us and it's working None of i, I mean it, 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 you would have to conclude that it was working because i think if, if if i've understood you correctly you would acknowledge that if we'd focused on what you're um uh, voting on it, it the debate would not have gone in the way that it's gone the numbers wouldn't have moved in the way that they've moved no 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 yes yeah, unfortunately i think i suspect you're right about that Thank you, Prakash. 24 minutes after 10. Thank you, everybody, keen to have informed, open-minded and respectful conversations about this issue. I appreciate on social media that, that, that it's very hard to do that, but on this programme we will always try. 24 minutes after 10 is the time. David's in Frinton on Sea. Could it have been different, David? Could we have had the debate that Prakash and many others, including very, very good friends of mine that I've been in contact with over the weekend, um, wish, wish that they'd seen rather than the one we are seeing? I wish as well, James. I wish as well, but unfortunately, with the referendum, um, there's going to be one outcome. People are going to vote leave or remain. And our you're not you're not going to win any prizes for that, David. <laughs> no, no, <but laughs> for look, that insight. Look the frame, yeah, but look, the frame debate is politicians are very skilled, and we live in a world where people's attention span is out of the net. Uh, the EU debate is very, very complex. So complex that people like Boris Johnson, David Cameron, etc., change their mind every so often, every few years. They want to remain. They, they want to come out. So it, it's so if they don't know what what the issues are, what helps for us? So politicians are skilled, and they think, what can we do to get more people to vote for our side and the other side? And unfortunately, if you try to explain TTIP stuff like that, mm. you don't get nowhere. But give them a simple argument saying, look at these people can over here taking their jobs, or if we leave the EU, we're going to be in Armageddon. It's much simpler for people. And I'm one of the people you refer to, first of all. I'm natural. I'm a very liberal person. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm non-xenophobic, non-racist, etc. Sure. But I have a, I'm very unhappy about how the EU runs things, what they've done to Greece, etc. So I couldn't, I'm not supporting the EU, but I'm not supporting the people who are supporting to get out of the EU. So I will be outstanding on, on Thursday. Unfortunately, because there's no argument for me there. So your 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 head would vote to leave, but your heart yeah. won't let you because of the yeah. support, yeah. because of the people you would be giving support to. Yes, that's so correct. This yeah. this I think you I think you're wrong, but I can't fault your mm. reasoning, uh, and I certainly can't tell you to, to 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 how to vote or indeed you know to change your mind or anything like that. But but it, it, this is this was the spectre from the start, wasn't it, David? This idea, I always use the parallel with fox hunting, because on fox hunting, I didn't, oh, yeah. be between you and me, I didn't give a monkey's either way whether we could polished fox hunting or not. But as the, as the vote got closer and closer, I found myself thinking, do you know what, this lot on the, on the anti-fox hunting side, they're pretty vulgar and uncouth. They're prepared to hurt human beings to protect a, uh, so I, I coined this phrase anti-anti. You almost end up being anti-anti. And that's ridiculous, and, and it's illogical. And with something like fox hunting, it doesn't really matter. But with something like this, it's a real shame that people have, have been led down that road. Well, one thing I would say is that I'm concerned about what happens afterwards. So if I support the Leave campaign, the victors there, I'll be very uncomfortable if they, they move on from that and start to have a more influence in, in domestic politics. So that's, again, another reason that I'm, I, I'm reluctant to vote for Leave. I hear you. Does that make sense? No, it makes, it makes perfect sense. No, it does make perfect sense. It's the whole point of this discussion, actually. Um, I, I never said, Ian, in Camden, that, that we couldn't cope with a better class of debate, mate. I said, I'm not sure that many of us would have joined in. That's the problem. I, I mean, as David perfectly highlighted, from the perspective of his own voting intentions, 
you, you sit in a darkened room, uh, metaphorically speaking, and you talk about not what's right and wrong, not what's good and bad, not what's desirable and undesirable, not what's moral and immoral, but what's going to move people from undecided to our side or from the other side to our side. What can we do to win? That's what they do. It's not exactly revelatory, and they end up going for whatever proves most effective, even if it is unattractive, shall we say, sometimes. Frank is in Canterbury. Frank, what would you like to say? Good morning, James. Hello, Frank. Yeah, so I would like to, to say as well, it would have been much, much better and nicer if we'd have had a solid debate um, on the issue. Could we have done, though? What would that debate have looked like, Frank? Well, I guess, obviously, sort of, if everybody was, if you like, even-handed, both the Remain and the Leave, rather than sort of de degenerating it into something, this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and leaving people sort of rather confused, and then turning things in sort of, um, to, for the people who want to stay, and then for things like me, I want to leave, but I want to leave because I believe we're better off out of it, not because I'm a bigot or I'm a racist, um, and I think that's the thing that's, who speaks for you? Who, who speaks for you? Well, at the moment, um, sort of, you could almost say nobody speaks. Nobody speaks for people. So like you me. are you are a liberal lever, a non-racist, anti-xenophobic, pro-leave, and you don't feel anybody on that side of the campaign has properly represented your position. Well, I, 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 I think that if I were, if you were to push me, I would have probably said maybe like the Ian Duncan Smith, definitely not Nigel Farage, but Ian, 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 Duncan, Ian Duncan, Duncan Smith, Michael Gove, I think have, in my opinion, have behaved very well throughout all all, all of this campaign. And yet, Varsi, um, Varsi picks on. Gove quite specifically with his comments regarding Turkey and accuses him of being a liar today. Well, you know, I mean, we're always going to get these things which are going to happen in this uh, in, in this debate, but I think this is where it's gone to. It's, it's kind of lauded itself, and um, I thought Peter Haynes' contribution sort of last week when he made was absolutely disgraceful and disrespectful to people like me and to my wife. Um, you know, and um, it's it's very disheartening when you hear those things because you were very right in, in opening statements when you said, "Who speaks for people like us?" And yes. the, the answer is, um, what, what did Peter Hayne say? Is this the line about not 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 all Brexiters are racist, but all racists are Brexiters? Yes. But why does that offend you? Because obviously he's in 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 in, in, his ten, in, in one way he's saying that I'm that, that, that I'm a racist and my wife is a racist. But uh, you're not. You're, you're you're he's saying that people like you exist. Not not all like not all leavers are racist. But he, he in his experience, everyone he's encountered who is a racist turns out to be to be pro leave. I, I mean, I think now if we open up the phone lines and said, "Are you a racist who wants to remain in the European Union?" things would be pretty quiet, Frank. Possibly, but I mean, I, I can only speak obviously for the way I feel, uh, um, and um, the way I felt obviously when he said that, I thought it was totally wrong, and he, he, it's lowering the debate to something obviously sort of which is the lowest common denominator on, on all sides. I'm not. There's no, I know. I'm mean, certainly covering both sides today. I, I, I hear you, and because I, I think I've made comments similar to what Peter Hayne has said, but it, but it's just an observation about what comes into the studio. Mm. Obs well, observation about contributions to the program. I've asked friends who, who, who are on, on uh, either side of the debate whether or not they can think of any sort of outwardly uh, xenophobic people or outwardly racist people who are in favour of, of remaining in the European Union. And, and I don't think anyone's come back to me with, with an example yet. But then again, James, you're always going to get people out there who will latch on to anything if they have racist views, wh wh whether, it's, wh whether it's going to a football match or whether it's, uh, you know, whether they're, whether, whether they're sort of, you know, black footballers or whatever. You're always going to get people who, who, are on, who are on the edge like that. And they, and they will latch on to any, any sort of cause. Um, or and the bigger the flag, the bigger the flag, the, 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 the more people will rally to it, and, and there are a few bigger flags, of course, than, than, than fear of the unknown. Uh, Frank, thank you. Thank you all the callers for the first half, of the, first half hour of the programme. I'm, uh, I'm a little late for the news as a result of how much attention I was paying to what they were saying. You are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Gisela Stewart, someone has suggested, as a, as a spokesperson for people on the Leave side of the referendum debate, who, like Saeed Avasi, who has switched sides, are disgusted by the hate and xenophobia that they claim they see on, on that side of the fence. So that, there you go, there is one. 10.34 is the time you're listening to LBC, where the question I'm asking is, could the referendum debate, could the campaign have ever gone in a direction that didn't leave it open to having become subsumed in, in hate and xenophobia? It's a question that assumed a new urgency on Friday. Um, for, uh, well, very obvious reasons on Thursday, for very obvious reasons, we talked about it on Friday. And I, I just want to take a moment to thank everybody for, for the very kind words 
you have sent me and indeed the three million plus people who have viewed it and, and shared my little comments my opening monologue on friday's program um it it, it, it needed to be said so i said it 10 35 is the time sharon is in oxford sharon what would you like to say yeah hello hi hello sharon. um yeah i'm getting disturbed about the whole way in which the whole view that if you want to leave the european union you're voting to leave that you are racist I'm a black woman, um, and I'm voting to leave. Um, and um, I just find it like what's happened is what is racism is being turned on its head. Um, I find as a black person that the European Union's immigration policy, which is now the policy of this country, um, basically it's favouring the immigration, unlimited numbers of immigration, of predominantly white Caucasian people from within the European Union, and it discriminates against people who want to come from outside the EU, most of whom are not white people. And I think that, you know, this whole idea that an Australian points-based immigration system applied to people from Europe and outside Europe equally, to say that that is racist, I think this is, it's ra is madness. But no one um, says that bit's racist. Well, it's, it's the other bits. It's the, it's the, it's the picture of, it's the picture of Syrian refugees marching through, it's not even Croatia, is it? They're it, it, being held up as somehow evidence that we can't cope anymore, and it, it's the othering and the simple speaking. And also, you must recognise there's lots of people on, on the, the, the leave side of the debate. I'm sure there's racists on the other side too, but on the leave side of the debate, there's lots of people who would find what you've just said, we want fewer white people and more black people, quite problematical. Well, the U European Union's um, immigration policy, which is now the British, British government's immigration policy, is that we can have unlimited migration from the European Union. No, no, I know. That, I, I'm, not, I'm not disputing okay. that, Sharon. I'm just pointing out that, that there are plenty of people. I mean, look, I, I can just look there now and find you a, 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 a social media example of people effectively uh, applauding. Again, legal reasons we need to tread carefully. But let, let's just say there are plenty of people who, who would be very uncomfortable about the thought of more black people coming here and fewer white people being here who, who are on the same side of the, of the debate as you are. It's not. No one's calling you a racist for, for that. They're just saying, well, look, who you're, look who's sitting next to you on the bus. Yeah, of course there are, but, and I, and I agree that that's the case, but I don't feel um, uncomfortable voting to leave. I think that the British government needs to make an immigration policy up that isn't racist and isn't just... Here we go, I've got it for you. Char Charlie's yeah. been in touch. Charlie's just tweeted me while you've been talking. This is a white country, don't forget that. This woman who's on now is a racist because there is not enough black people, question mark. There you go. I'm not saying, yeah, of course people are going to say that, but the point is that I feel, personally, that we should be applied, that anybody who wants to come to the UK, whether they're coming from from Europe, or whether they're coming from Africa or America, Australia or the United States or Japan, that they should be able to apply on the same application form according to the same rules, and that the best people who apply from across the world should be able to come into the UK on the simple rules. What's happening with the EU yes, immigration the, the policy is that whether you're unskilled, uneducated, criminal, or paedophile, you can actually come into the United Kingdom without being checked. Whatsoever. Well, that, that's that. I have to stop. I have to stop you there on on, on sim, simply on factual, simply on factual reasons. I mean, the 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 the, 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 the border checks on criminal, the border checks on criminal records are, aren't aren't better or worse according to where you've come from. Well, they should. Well, um, you know, I, I, my personal view is that it should be wherever you come from. Basically, if you come from France, you should apply on the same form as a person from Brazil. And if the Brazilian person is seen as neat, as more necessary for the country, or but we, or whatever, but we don't do that at the moment, Sharon. There's no, there's exactly, no. That, yeah, exactly. That's and we could fair. do if we wanted to. It would just mean everybody had to stay at customs for a hell of a lot longer. And yeah, that's fine. We should do that. We should do even that. Even for people coming on holiday. Yeah, that's but fine. this just do doesn't that. make any it sense, what you're saying. It does make sense. Okay. It makes sense that if you want to immigrate to the country... So how do you prove, when, when you're leaving Oxford, Oxford, when you're popping over to France for a, for, 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 for a shopping trip in Paris, how do you prove that you don't have a criminal record? Well, obviously, I show my passport. The way in which you applied... You don't, you don't, your criminal record's not on your passport. How do you prove it? The way in which you'd apply to immigrate... I have some friends who moved to Australia. They have to do a lot of checks. They have to show that they have the money. They have the skills. It, it, exactly. So I'm not asking you about moving to Australia. I'm asking you about popping to France. Saying, popping to France for the afternoon. If you, well, you know, however that would be done, would be done. I've not travelled that oh, okay. much. Okay, however that would be done, would be done. This is, this is kind of the point I was very gently leading you towards. You haven't got a clue how it would be done, but you're absolutely certain that it could be, should be, and would be. I, I'm here to tell you it couldn't, it wouldn't, and arguably it shouldn't. Hassan is in Slough. Hassan, what's going on? What should this debate have looked like? What could this debate have looked like? I, I don't think it would have looked any different, I think, because I think it's a 
referendum has been a complete farce from the beginning. And I knew at the outset that uh, we would not be able to make a uh, decision based on fact. Uh, it's all been about emotion. Um, so I don't think the referendum should have happened, but obviously we're here now. We can't do anything about it. Uh, but I'm really ashamed of the state of politics now because of the campaign. And uh, I don't think we could have had an alternative uh, discourse. Now, when I, um, what I'm about to say now, I made the same point to Ian Dale a few weeks ago, and he called me contemptuous. What I said was that... Um, <laughs> a fellow Tory, yeah. Uh, what I said was um, that we're not going to have a referendum on the issue of setting interest rates and tax rates, because the issue is very complicated. The Chancellor does that. The issue of Europe is a thousand times more complicated and we as people are expected to make a decision based on emotions and, and not, not hard facts. So, you know, it really is a shame. But again, to answer your question, I don't think it would, would have been possible to hold an alternative. Because it's a yes uh, or no, because it's black or white. Uh, I, I, j j just for the record, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you must have gone a little further than that to merit dis disapproval from my friend and colleague. Um, but, but we haven't got a tape here, so we can't go back and check. The, the point, surely, is that the, the referendum question has to be yes or no. It has to be black and white. It has to be binary. The and membership really. of the European Union is, is almost unfathomable in its m multiplicity of complexities. Maybe that's where the anti-expert line comes from, because we don't want to listen to experts, because then we realise that we're probably not even qualified to make a decision on Thursday. <laughs> That's my point. You yeah. see, that's exactly my point. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be voting. I'd, I'd, like, I'd love to boycott this referendum as protest, but obviously you know, the issue is too serious to do that. So I'm, I'm going, to be, going to be voting to to remain. Uh, but I think you know, after the referendum, the politicians should really look at themselves and uh, ask themselves how. I think it's a lot uh, more. Uh, I think it's the media more than the politicians. I think the politicians follow where the media leads. But that, that maybe that's because of our, our sort of relative backgrounds. I know Hassan is a regular caller to the station and was a, was a conservative candidate himself a few years ago. 10.42 is the time. Um, Robert's in Acton. Robert, what would you like to say? I'd like to say, I've lived in England all of my adult, well, all of my life, but we joined the EU and I've lived all of my adult life in the EU. Yeah. One thing I didn't understand then is why did we join the EU? And I'd like to ask, what was, what has the journey been? I well, mean, mate, this isn't this isn't one of those phone. This isn't one of those phone -ins. You're supposed to ring in to tell me what you think. No, no, no. Ask I'm me to. No, I can't answer your questions. Okay, I'm sorry, but the reason I'm saying this is I don't know what to think. I don't know which way to vote because I don't know how. I mean, I don't know the journey that we've. Um, I mean, well, the, the problem with this is, the, the, do you know? I'll tell you what you've done. Actually, you've nailed it. Uh, because what I say now to you, it, you say, what journey have we been on? And I could say something like, well, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. And, and uh, maybe that's linked to being a membership of the EU. But then I could turn around and say to you, well, it, look, we're the fifth largest economy in the world. We don't need the EU. You can use every single fact almost to make a point for both sides, I think. Well, I'd like to make a point because Britain, in historically, has been able to weave their, their, their way through any difficulty. All right? And I'm confident that if we left the EU, Britain would survive. Well, of course, Brit Britain would survive, but I, I, again, people people say, I don't want to survive, I want to thrive. I, I agree. What I'm saying is, because we don't know, we, we know what happens if we stay in, because we'll just carry on the same way as we've been for the last 41 years. And then you have to ask well, yourself how, how good the last 41 years have been for you. That's right. That's the journey I want to know about. But then I'll say, they could have been even better if we weren't tied to this ludicrous red tape merchant in Brussels, or, or I, 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 someone else can come in and say, could have been a hell of a lot worse. I understand the argument, but what I want to know now is w what we're voting on now. I don't know the journey, and nobody's been able to say what the journey has been. Well, they might have been able to say it if we hadn't conducted proceedings under this sort of toxic miasma of othering and xenophobia. That's my view. I make no apology for that, but that does not, that will not influence my vote. I'm not going to cast my vote according to the company that I keep. I'm going to cast my vote according to the understanding of the issues that I have. And Robert suggests that not a great deal of effort has been put into helping us all come to a proper, better understanding of the issues. I would be inclined to agree with him. And then, of course, the problem is that this 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 demonization of experts as well really troubles me the I mean, othering othering of people on background and origins is one thing but to demonize experts I, 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 where do you go when your kids ill if you don't go to an expert
Seriously, well, who do you go to? And you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. This is the line that's, I think, the one I've been most impressed by this weekend. And, and I'll tell you why, because obviously I get an awful lot of um, uh, charming missives from people who are uh, very furious and, and, and very unfond of foreigners. But equally, when we've talked about Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party on this program, I've said to you in the past, it's strange how many echoes there are in the people that think any criticism of Jeremy Corbyn must be born of some sort of conspiracy. Um, and this line by Nick Cohen, is it, it's absolutely brilliant. Paranoid populism's defining principle can be summarized in a paragraph. No one contradicts me in good faith. My opponents must be lying. They must be corrupt. They are more than merely mistaken, they are degenerate. So whether you're getting it in the neck from a Corbynista who thinks any criticism of him is evidence of your corruption, this is when they say, well, you know, you're, you've been bought and sold, you're, you're, you're a shill, you're this, you're that, you're the other. They might refer to employers and say that's proof that you're biased. You can't, you can't actually contradict someone in good faith. And we've always had that as well on the other side of the coin. You can't say to somebody, that's simply not true. It proves that you are, I don't know, what, what, I mean, I've been accused of supporting white genocide a few times over the course of the weekend. Quite, quite what logic that's supposed to display is beyond me and I suspect everybody listening. But that phrase there, those, those sentences, no one contradicts me in good faith. That's where this debate's gone wrong. Because every time you stand up and say that's not true, the other side don't just say, yes it is. They call you a liar. They call you corrupt. They call you degenerate. And the language is, is absolutely, absolutely toxic. So could it have gone any other way? I don't know. 03456060973. Andrew's in Redbridge. Andrew, what do you think? Oh, hi, James. Hello. Um, I suppose like everybody else, I've been um, waiting to hear some facts. And finally, I found some. There's a, there's a video clip that I've just seen from a professor, Michael Dugan, from Liverpool University, the law school, and he, he's been studying EU law uh, as it relates to the UK, and he's contributed to the Parliamentary Select Committees and advised, advised the government on this. Um, this guy's been teaching since 2004, and he, he's, he's posted, a, or somebody's posted a 25-minute uh, video of him actually going through factual information about all the things that, that, that people are worried but about. He's an expert. He's an expert. The British people yeah, have had enough yeah. of experts. No, no, but this guy teaches it. Yeah, but he's a still an expert, and the British people have had enough of experts, according to the Justice Minister Michael Gove, who, when he was Education Minister, appeared to believe that expertise was a wonderful thing that we should be encouraging all of our children to pursue and achieve. But do we really want to know the facts. Well, you do. Of what the laws are, how, how the EU relates to us, and how we relate to the EU. So, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm being a bit facetious with you, I'm, I'm, I'm joshing a little, but, but what, what, what has it done to your position? How, how is it? Because I haven't seen it myself, I'm not familiar with it. Okay, well, I mean, I, I've, I've always been uh, on the on the Remain side, but he's pointed out, uh, can, can I just say, on the issue of yes. the freedom of the people, uh, yeah, we've had something like three million um, immigrants over the last um, a few years or so, but there's something like two million Brits who live, work, study outside the EU. Uh, sorry, sorry, outside of Britain, all over the EU. Yes, but they're not immigrants, they're expats. Expats. But the thing is, though, if we did if we did come out, the the status would have to be changed. It'd have to be negotiated. So there's uh, there's, there's two million people. And does the Liverpool professor address this directly, or is that something else that you're personally well, kind of? He he just simply points out that this is the fact. We've got two million Brits living outside the UK, all over the EU, and their their situation would have to be addressed in that. It would have to be negotiated depending on where they are, which country, then they'd have to abide by new rules, rules that we don't know about yet. I, one of my closest friends lives outside uh, Britain. Uh, he is British, and he's already voted to leave in a, in, a, in a postal vote. And his his contention would be that he knows it might actually have a, a, a short term negative impact on him and his life, but he genuinely believes that the interests. And he's he's a very uh, he's the very antithesis of, of xenophobia or racism or anything like that. But his argument is it's not just going to be better for Britain to see the European Union in some way diluted or, or, or damaged, but it would be better for every country in Europe. He lives in Spain. I don't understand. So, so he's in favour of us coming out? Yes. 
But why, though? Or, because no, he acknowledges what you've just described. He acknowledges that there will be difficulties. It may affect his children's access to university. It may even affect his savings, his, his financial situation. But he, uh, uh, in a very academic way, is persuaded that, that there is too, too much of the, uh, the sclerotic nature of the institution, the unaccountability and, and, and the, um, uh, the sovereignty issue. He genuinely believes that he will be hurting himself in the short term, but doing good for his country in the long term. I think that puts him in a tiny minority. I'm just reminding you that he exists. Mm, mm, mm. Actually, I'm just reminding you that I've got friends, Andrew. It's 10.53. <laughs> Craig is in Brentwood. Craig, what would you like to say? Yeah, hi James. Hello, um, I just want to actually firstly want to applaud you for the tone of the conversation this morning. It's easy to do, mate. It's easy yeah. to do. Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I am voting leave and I'm sticking to voting leave, but I've really hated, um, because, you know, obviously what happened with, um, Joe Cox. Yeah, be careful now, because of course charges have been brought, so the, it's an ongoing legal case, we can't say no, anything no, else. Let's say the whole situation yeah. was abhorrent and leave it at that, but the, the, the problem is in the, in the tonality that follows, you're made for believing on principles that I have, for example, that, you know, my, my wife is, um, uh, an immigrant, if you like, she's a spouse visa and we had to go through and jump through hoops for us to be together and um, in order for her to get her, her travel access she's from the Middle East uh, we had to spend one year apart um, while we uh, well I got a job back in the UK while I was looking after my mother while she was terminally ill and you know we've seen the side of the immigration thing and yeah it was hard but it was a very very fair process because I could not bring my wife over until I got enough you know, to be able to support her. So people say that immigration is easy from, you know, the point of view of the EU and it's a bit racist. I, I kind of go along with that because, you know, why should I, um, well, why should I? I mean, I'm not sounding self-entitled, but, you know, the journey we had to go through a very, very horrible time in, in my life when you need the love of your partner next to you that I was unable to bring her across because we were working on the... Um, why would it be better if everybody had to do that? I think it would just be... Well, I thought, I thought you were describing it as an un unpleasant experience. Well, it was, but it was a fair, it was fair. We, we didn't ask for any more, okay. in a way, of favour than anybody else got. And, you know, I, I just, I just think... In but, but is, I mean, it, 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 where are you getting the idea that that's what the new system would look like? Because well, if you want to trade with countries, the, 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 the real challenge is going to be having free movement of goods, but not having free movement of people. So the, the, the reason why your wife had to jump through all of these hoops is that we don't have free trade with her country. On board, you got now, now, there's, see, now your phone line's gone, which everyone's going to take as evidence that, that you had a brilliant comeback oh. and a brilliant answer to my point, no, but I'm we've been to the gremlin. Still hear you. No, you can hear me. Go on, try again. So, because the whole point about free movement of people is that... Free movement of people and yes. the tariff-free trade is something of an illusion because the money that we pay into the EU, if you take the money that just stays there, that means that we're paying an equivalent 7% on the, the, um, on the, on the, uh, the tariff, if, if you like, 7% on all of the business that we do. And if we go under the World Trade Organization, we trade at 4%, which is actually... Well, I, yeah, they, they, they've also told us not to vote to leave, haven't they, the World Trade Organization? So, you, again, it's one of those things oh, you, you can yeah. cite from either you can cite from either side, which possibly is why the debate hasn't been conducted in the more complicated territories that, that we've been examining this morning. Because everybody could be turned around one way or the other as proof that each side is right and each side is wrong. Unless you actually focus upon that endless list of world leaders and, 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 and bankers and economists and business people. They say, but then again, even now, David Cameron's tweeting about how every football team in the Premier League is in favour of Remain. And, and you can see why, even if you're a fully paid up member of the Remain camp, you can see why some people find that a little bit iffy. Oh, just give it a rest, Dave. Football. Well, it seems what. Okay. Jack's in South End on Sea. Jack, what would you like to say? Yeah, just a quickie. Um, I, I, I wholly agree with the, one of your previous callers, Hassan, who I think hit the nail right on the head. I, I blame the referendum itself. It's not the British way of making decisions in this country. Um, I'm not a great fan of our system of democracy, but we have a parliamentary democracy. We, we elect educated people from Oxford and Cambridge to make decisions for us. So why? 
have a referendum on a subject... Not just Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, you, you, well, there are plenty of people in Parliament who, who, who didn't go to you. They're, they're, they're all graduates and postgraduates and so on. I mean, what, what, why... No, no, they're not. Hang on. I mean, you've got, you've got all sorts of people in... I, I grant okay. you there's a, there's a b b preponderance of university-educated people, but it's not the only path to, to Parliament. But, but, but they, they are... Uh, let's say educated people in Parliament are overrepresented. <laughs> you accept that. Yes. Why have a referendum on a subject so complicated as whether to stay in or out of the EU and pass that on to Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who quite frankly, you know, uh, get confused. Um, it's, it's caused an information overload in people's minds. Now, MPs can argue about these in Parliament, disagree, but then they can go to the pub afterwards and have a good laugh afterwards. Um, ordinary people can't do that. Well, because, because you make it something bigger, don't you? You make it something uh, 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 more profound and, and less complicated. You turn it into something like, a, you know, a matter of, of patriotism or a matter of our country or a matter of... You, you, you have to, I think, to pursue that argument, completely ignore all the complexities and the subtleties that you're describing. And if you have to completely ignore complexities and subtleties, you kind of have to demonise the experts, don't you? Because otherwise, otherwise you look very silly. I don't know, it's, it's, it's just not the correct way to make decisions of the, of, on subjects of this uh, magnitude and importance and, uh, you know... Um, and and, and uh, that is, a, you know, a very neat description of what our democracy is supposed to be. Uh, Robert Harris, the author, who interestingly wrote Fatherland, which you, you might be familiar with, is a cracking tale. He, he tweeted a couple of things over the last few days that, that I had to agree with, just, just in terms of, he cannot remember our country being reduced to such a base level of discussion and division, and, and please God, whatever the result is next week, this week now, um, please God, let's never have any, let's never ever have any more again.